Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the IT Guys. This is episode one, and my name is Eric Hendricks. So hello and welcome. I'm really excited about tonight. Um, To really kick off this podcast, I I wanted to really focus on something that was near and dear to my heart, something that I'm very excited about. Um, So I don't want to spend too much time beating around the bush. Um, But having said that, I'm going to beat around the bush for a second. (laughs) Um, So first of all, thank you so much for tuning in and and listening to our show. Um, If you watched episode zero, you kind of already know what we're hoping to accomplish with these videos. And you'll also notice some huge changes to our to our appearance um, for this podcast. And it's it's going to continue to change. Um, We're we're still putting together graphics and logos and and, uh, and and basically a brand for the IT guys. Um, so what you see behind me and around me tonight is is just kind of the next step. And um, uh, so hopefully tonight's content speaks for itself. And and we we would we would very very much encourage you to leave feedback to send us uh, send us an email. Um, you can get a hold of us on our website or on social media, and all of that information will be in the description. Um, so you know. Th- you're, you're here and that's that's what's important so that that is all the beating around the bush I'm going to do that's all the plug I'm going to I want to make for for our business or for our podcast or our, our social media um, so let's let's really dive into this because as I said Linux is, is something that's very near and dear to my heart and it is it not only serves as a cornerstone for a lot of my personal computing but it also serves as the cornerstone for our business and our philosophy behind how we do business. Um, so here at the IT guy, you'll hear us talk about Linux a lot. Um, if you have uh, more technically inclined, quote unquote, nerds in, in your in your social circle, you've probably heard of Linux. If um, and in fact, you may not even know that you've you've uh, been exposed to Linux. Um, uh, if you have an Android device, you're familiar with Linux. If you've been to just about ninety percent of all websites out there, you've seen Linux in action. Um, so before I get into the crux of what is Linux, um, I should probably define a couple of terms. And the first is operating system. An operating system is um, part of your computer. Um, it could be Windows, it could be Mac, it could be, it could be Unix or Linux. Um, most, a lot of those are outside the scope of this video, but if, if you think of your computer as a layered cake, um, if, if you, you have a cake on a table and it's got different layers, you know, chocolate, vanilla, vanilla, um, and each, each component is a different layer. So you've got the hardware layer and that's, that's your keyboard, that's your monitor. Um, then you've got firmware and, and firmware basically talks to the hardware on your computer. Um, so that the operating system knows what, it, what is dealing with, knows how to talk to it. So the, the next layer up would definitely be the operating system. Um, the operating system handles scheduling tasks. Um, it, it handles launching applications. Um, so anytime you press a key on your keyboard, uh, the operating system has, has a hand in that and helps pass that keystroke up through the, through the layer cake, um, through the hardware to whatever active window is open on your desktop. Um, so the operating system is, is more or less the, the, um, more or less the the mind um, behind your computer, not so much the brain, but more more the mind. Um, then the other term I should probably define ahead of time. Um, you'll hear this a lot uh, in tonight's discussion, and that's open source. Uh, open source is a methodology, a philosophy behind software development. Um, so in most cases, you would go to the store or anymore, uh, you'd go online to, um, to Blizzard or Microsoft or Adobe or any number of software vendors, and you would purchase their application, you'd download their installer, you'd run it, and you'd start using their application. Um, but let's say you're working on it one day and, and you're technically savvy, and you come across a, a bug. Um, you, you click on some command and the application crashes. Um, well, what do you do? Um, that, that annoying bug report uh, window, you know, do you want to submit a report, yes or no? 
uh, comes up and most of us just hit no and we, we go about our day without giving a second of thought, uh, we relaunch the application, we go back to work. The problem is, um, the problem is, um, if, if what you're working on, you're familiar with, um, say you're a web developer and you you came across a website and you came across a bug, uh, with closed source software, um, only the people that work for that company have access to the source code, to the actual programming behind the application. But with open source, um, you can you can go to GitHub or, or people's personal pages or um, just about anything in the Linux arena. Um, it comes under the classification of open source, and that means that the source code, that means that the programming behind every application, every operating system, um, is available for you to download. You can go out um, to uh, to a Linux distribution, say Ubuntu, and download all of the code. You can see exactly what is in the operating system. Um, and there's there's a couple of advantages to this. Instead of, if, if the software that you purchase, the closed source software that you purchase has 20 developers, only those 20 people will ever, ever have visibility into the op- application. So the ability to innovate is limited to those 20 people. But let's take a similar application and let's put it in open source and let's upload it for all the world to see on, say, GitHub. Um, which is just a huge community collection of, of software ranging from just about everything you can think of. Any type of application you could think of, there's probably an application on GitHub for it. And um, that, uh, so let, let's take our, our sample web application. Let's, let's say we want to open source it. We upload it to GitHub and, and we tell all of our, all of our coding buddies and um, all of our coworkers, hey, here's application XYZ. Um, why don't you go check out the code for me? Now all of a sudden, hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands of people now have the ability to look at that code and make changes, um, add new features, find bugs, find security flaws, and submit those to be included into the mainstream of the application. So this happens all of the time. Um, the, um, the, uh, The Equifax hack recently, um, Everyone tried to blame open source software for the for the breach that leaked most of our uh, social security numbers out onto the internet. Well, truth be told, that the the bug that the hackers used to exploit Equifax was actually um, something that was found by a developer and submitted back to the uh, people who developed the web uh, the web server called Apache. Um, so a, a developer actually found the bug, submitted a fix, and they patched it. Um, so try doing that with someone like Microsoft or Adobe or Apple. Um, they're not going to let you monkey around in their code. They're not going to let you submit um, code for a, a cool new feature. Say, say the uh, the print menu is just it's too old, and um, we're all we're all tired of looking at the exact same print menu. And you design an entirely new print menu. For an open source application, you could submit it, and the developers uh, on the team would consider those changes. But uh, someone like Adobe, Microsoft, Apple—they're—they're they're not going to give the same con- consideration because it's closed source. It's—it's—it's um, it's, it's their product, and they don't want anyone else messing with it. Um, to be fair, there are a few exceptions. Uh, companies like Google and many others have bug bounty programs where if you submit a bug um, and uh, and your test cases, sometimes they will give you uh, cash for uh, as a bounty for finding a, a bug. Um, that's a lot more prevalent in the open source world than, than in the closed source, but uh, t- take what I said as, as kind of a rule of thumb and, and not, not, a, not something that's poured in concrete. Um, so that's that, that's kind of the two terms that you need to understand when we're talking about Linux. Uh, so the crux of tonight is what is Linux, and Linux is an operating is an open source operating system. And uh, one one of the amazing things about an application that is open source is it's inherently free. 
Um, it's available for anyone to download to look at the source code, but it's also available for anyone to download and use. Um, typically that's considered, uh, it's free for personal use. Um, a lot of software projects have um, premium solutions that may or may not have additional features or provide um, provide telephone support or that kind of thing for businesses, but inherently anything open source is is more or less free. Um, there are notable exceptions, but for, for our purposes, open source and free um, go hand in hand uh, with with uh, with Linux and applications that run on Linux. Um, anything open source. Um, so Linux is an open source operating system. You can you can go download the Linux kernel. Um, you can go download uh, uh, GNU GNU slash Linux, which is the the technical name for the uh, Linux operating system. Um, uh, you, you can go and download it. There's hundreds and hundreds of different distributions. Um, so think of it as, as uh, operating system families. Um, some of the notable ones are Fedora, CentOS, um, Ubuntu, um, Arch, which is something that I, I run quite a bit here at home. Um, and then there's there's commercial offerings like OpenSUSE has uh, has an enterprise offering, and probably the biggest, most well known is is uh, Red Hat. Um, they're actually a two billion dollar company built on open source, um, so that kind of is what is Linux. Um, so the the where of Linux, <laughs> Linux is everywhere, and I'm I'm not just saying that because I'm I'm a crazy fanboy. Um, if you have an Android device, you are running a Linux kernel. Um, if you visited a, a website, the web server, um, I, 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 it could be anywhere upwards of 70% of all web servers nowadays are running uh, Linux. Um, a lot of your embedded devices, um, so some of your some of your Internet of Things, your IoT devices, so your 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 smart light bulbs or your smart outlets or um, your smart washer and dryer. Um, could be running some stripped down form of Linux. Um, uh, some of the some of the robots um, that you're seeing working in uh, in factories, more or less, there's a chance for uh, um, for those to be running Linux. Um, and, and in fact, I only because it it had crashed. <laughs> but uh, I was at a I believe it was a movie theater not long ago. And I noticed while I was rebooting that uh, it was running Linux. Um, so movie theater monitors, um, projectors, smart devices, IoT, uh, Android phones, um, and then on the desktop and on the server side, you know, Linux is everywhere. Um, so if you know what to look for, it's it's not hard to find. Um, so what is this? So that's great. Linux is open source. Thousands of people work on Linux code every day. Thousands and thousands and thousands more work um, as systems administrators, as, as database administrators, as developers, as desktop users. Um, you know, Linux is everywhere. Tons of people use it, contribute to it, add new code to it, um, check it for security. So. That's all well and good, but what does that mean for you, the the end user? What does that mean for you, the IT shop who's considering Linux for the first time? Um, what that means is there is an alternative. Um, there's somewhere else you can go. Um, you know, a Apple has been doing more and more to get their Mac OS uh, ready for the enterprise, um, so that you can use Microsoft Office. Uh, for Mac, so you can connect it to your to your work uh, to your work uh, network. Um, but for for a very very long time, Microsoft and their Windows platforms have have monopolized the the office industry, and they've become a little a little stagnant. Um, you know, when you don't have competition in in your field then you're not you're less likely to innovate there's there's no incentive to to innovate in in what you're doing um, and so it seems like with each version of windows 
the features get fewer and fewer, the interface gets more and more confusing, it becomes less and less easy to administer uh, for your for your office network, um, and it seems to run slower and slower with with the same amount of resources. Um, so Linux is that competition. Linux is innovating. Linux is fighting for their share of the pie. Um, so Linux has to be creative. And uh, so, um, so today Linux is just as viable uh, of a desktop as um, as as Microsoft Windows. In fact, uh, as I mentioned, the, the the laptop I'm recording off of is running Arch Linux, a a particular distribution, um, and I've got all of my applications on here uh, that I I would use anywhere else. I've got an email application called uh, Thunderbird. I'm also experimenting with a new one called Mailspring. Um, I've I've got browsers. I've got Chrome and Firefox on here. I've got uh, I've got games. I run Steam. I, I play. Uh, I can play Civilization VI if if uh, if someone would like to go out and buy that for me. Um, OBS, the uh, open broadcasting software that uh, that uh, we're using to record and put overlays on on our show here, um, that runs under Linux and it's an open source software. Um, I take notes in an application called Simple Note. Um, there's there's just so many options out there. Um, with with a few exceptions, I I, I will be real. Um, do we have the Adobe Suite? No. Um, do we have uh, Microsoft Office? In and of itself, no. But over the last year or so, that has really begun to change because Office three sixty five, uh, the web uh, the web piece for Office three sixty five actually works in browsers under Linux. Um, people complain about Linux gaming. Uh, if if you don't feel like there's any games for Linux, then you really need to download Steam and look at the sheer number of titles. The, the the market share for games that run under Linux is growing every day. Games like Civilization VI, um, I believe Ark Evolved, um, uh, RimWorld, um, Rust, you know, a lot of these new games that have come out within the last year or so launched day one with Linux support. Um, so Linux is not just an operating system for nerds anymore. It's not some esoteric thing that uh, that uh, only a few people in really dark uh, parents' basements use anymore. It is viable. It is useful. Um, it is it is necessary for our, our for the world economy to continue to run, and that's no exaggeration. Um, so much of our infrastructure nowadays is run under Linux servers. Um, so. So what does that mean um, for for you as a business owner, for you as an IT manager, for you as a consumer? There are options. Um, you don't have to stick with the walled garden of Apple. You know, Apple has an amazing suite of tools. I know. I used to have all of them. I have. I had a MacBook. I have an iPhone. I have an iPad. We have an Apple TV. I used iCloud storage. Is an amazing platform unless you want to change things. Um, if if you want to try out different software, good luck. If it's not tied into their ecosystem, it's not going to work. Microsoft Windows. Um, you know, I had a a former client of ours uh, ran into an issue where their computer would not connect to their to their domain. You couldn't join a domain. Um, not only that, but you couldn't even connect to a server file share on this computer. Well, come to find out, on this $400 computer uh, came Windows 10 Home Edition. Um, Home Edition doesn't support the the enterprise uh, ability to join a, a work network or um, do, uh, do server-based file shares or file uh, printing. Um, it, it's designed for use in the home. Um, and it doesn't work in a small or large office environment. So I, I mentioned it was a $400 all-in-one desktop. Microsoft wants to charge charge this this person $200 on a $400 computer to unlock the few extra features that they need to make it viable for their business. Linux doesn't have that. If, if there's a feature that you need and someone has written an application for it, it's available. It's probably free. Um, so, 
why would you lock yourself into these vendors? Why would you continue to support uh, companies that have that are more worried about their bottom line than they are developing code? If, if you have a passion project, if there's something you're trying to build, you're going to put every ounce of energy into it. Um, if, you're, if you've got a startup or a small business that, that you've built from nothing, you are going to put every ounce of energy you have into that business. And the developers for open source are no different. You know, a lot of these people are just like us at the IT guys. We have day jobs. We have things that we have to do to pay the bills to support our families. But we have these projects that we're so passionate about, and we would pour every ounce of energy of every day into these projects if we could. There's one drawback. We have to make money. And you can, you can donate to these projects. You can help you can help fund these developers who are creating these open source applications, giving us alternatives that are not uh, just sending our personal data up to um, a, a an advertisement search engine company whose name I, I won't mention, um, Google. <clears throat> uh, they aren't trying to collect every shred of our browsing history um, so that they can sell us uh, the, the next widget or, or gadget, Amazon. Um, they aren't trying to nickel and dime us to death on licensing like Microsoft. Open source developers are developing their applications because they want to, because it fills a need for them or someone they know. Every one of these developers has a story, and every one of these developers is trying to um, is is trying to develop their their software. Um, most of them in their free time. Most of them make no money or next to no money. So why would we not band together as a community, download these open source tools, utilize these open source tools, instead of spending $200 for a Microsoft license, send $100, send $20 for all I care to a developer for, for an application that you use on, on a regular basis on your Linux install. Open source makes things better. When you get that many eyes on onto a piece of code, you just have that many more opportunities. And and people complain about how well it, it's open source. So, you know, even the bad guys can look at all the source code. Well, that's true. But I, I, I'm a bit of an idealist, and I would like to think that there's more good people out there trying to develop software for people like you and me than there are people that are looking at how, how can I use this to exploit the next Equifax? Um, how can I use this to exploit the next Amazon um, AWS container? Um, I'd like to think that there are more of us out there trying to do good than those of us that are trying to do bad. And open source is is a free platform. Not just free as in money, um, but, but free as in philosophy. Um, you're not tied down to a vendor. If, if one of the applications that I use today, the developer goes away, the software is still going to work. Um, and that gives me time to find a new project. Um, you know be it a music player if i'm if i'm listening to rhythm box uh, and an open source media player and that project ends tomorrow well that that's still going to work for a while and that gives me time to try out other things like vlc or or whatever other open source application i might come across that that plays music and i as as a small business owner as a open source and freedom enthusiast like like myself um if any of this sounds anything like like you, then consider Linux, consider open source, consider donating to the community, considering consider finding a, a, a group of podcasts like this one and and support the community. Give back when you when you can. You know, a year ago I was I had all Apple hardware and everything ran on iOS for me. And I can tell you over a year later, I am thrilled that I, I'm getting off of that platform. I'm I am gaining freedom. And if I don't like the way one application does it, I'm not tied into a vendor. I can switch to applications. I tried three different note taking applications before I ended up on Simple Note. F open source and Linux is freedom, and that's you know, that's that's an amazing amazing thing. Uh, so. 
I, I would highly recommend looking into Linux and open source. And if, if you need any help, by all means, go to our website, go to the Contact Us page, send us an email, and we would all be more than happy to to talk about Linux, to talk about what it is we use Linux for, and help get you started today on an, on a platform that's not going to change its mind and, and cancel your product next year or charge you $200. Just use those couple of extra features that you need. So I... I really encourage you to, to do so and tune in here in two weeks for episode number two. Thank you so much uh, for watching this episode. Give us a like, give us a subscription, and, uh, and have a great day.